Um, and I'm going to read question 43. So there's only 52 questions, so we're almost there. And in fact, we're going to take a break for Christmas and uh, do the Christmas story. So we only have a few more catechism questions for this year. Um, so question 43 says, what are the sacraments or ordinances? Which is just a, another word for it. Would you read this with me? I know it's long. The sacraments or ordinances given by God and instituted by Christ, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper, are visible signs and seals that are, we are bound together as a community of faith by his death and resurrection. By our use of them, the Holy Spirit more fully declares and seals the promises of the gospel to us. Good, thank you. I know that's a lot of words. See, the reason God gave us sacraments is to help us see him more clearly. Sacraments are visible signs and seals of Christ's finished work. Um, and the sacraments remind us that through Jesus, we're connected to God and we're connected to each other as a community of faith. And so today we're going to talk about these two sacraments and then after the sermon, we're going to celebrate communion. So we're going to start in Genesis 17 to talk about this. And you may know that in Genesis 13 and 15, the Lord promised a man named Abram, and he had no children. But he said, I'm going to give you as many descendants that you can't count them, like the stars in the sky. And this was a surprise, because Abram and his wife were very old, and they had no children. But Abram believed the Lord, and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And then the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. The Lord promised his own blood. The Lord promised his life as the guarantee of the promises he was making with Abram and the, his descendants. And so it was called circumcision, and it was a sacrament. It was a physical reminder of God's promises. Circumcision was something that separated God's people from the world. And it was also a picture of Christ being separated from God the Father in order to fulfill the covenant for us. So I'm going to read from Genesis 17 um, about the sacrament of circumcision. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make a covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations and kings will even come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. And this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, and every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or born, bought with money from any foreigner who's not your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. And so my covenant shall be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. So after we hear God's word, we read Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God 
will stand forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you because you are the source of life and truth. And Jesus, we worship you because you are full of mercy and love. Holy Spirit, would you please open our hearts and our minds to be transformed by the word of God. Amen. So one thing I want you to notice about what I read in Genesis 17 is the emphasis about what the Lord will do. You see, Abraham is expected to do certain things because he's a participant in the covenant. But it's not a relationship between equals. In verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham and he said, I am God Almighty. And in verse 2, he doesn't say, hey, let's establish a partnership, right? A partnership's between two equals. No, God says, I will make my covenant between me and you. And God calls it my covenant. He doesn't say our covenant. He says my covenant. Five different times, God says what he will do. He says, I will make you fruitful. I will make my covenant. I will make you into nations. I will give you the land. I will be their God. And so when we talk about sacraments, when we talk about worship, if we talk about marriage, who invented all these things? God invented all these things, okay? And so we don't get to attach our own ideas or meaning to these things. We can't change worship or sacraments or marriage into what we think it should be, because we didn't make them. And the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper were given to us by God for his glory and for our benefit, okay? And so we receive these things as gifts, and so we have to use them according to the way they were designed. So I want to jump ahead to the New Testament, and I want to read what Paul wrote to the Gentile believers in Christ, and he connects circumcision, which we just heard about, with baptism. Okay, there's a handoff from circumcision to baptism in Colossians 2, 11 to 14. Paul writes, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins. <laughs> And because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. So again, God is the primary actor in these verses. Do you see that? Like in Genesis 17, it says we were dead, but God made us alive. In Christ. It is God who forgave our trespasses. It's God who canceled our debt. He nailed our sin to the cross. He circumcised our hearts. God did all of the actions. And if you think about circumcision, an eight year old boy being circumcised, it's a received action, right? The child is passive, he's literally held down by his parents during the procedure. Okay, so circumcision is something he receives. And Paul is saying in Colossians 2 that baptism is just like that. That baptism is about God's covenant promises to us. Baptism is a sacrament we receive. It's about God's work in us. It's not about our work. Now, communion is a little different than baptism. It's a different sacrament. We participate in communion actively. And there's actually this beautiful parallelism in the Old Testament sacraments and the New Testament sacraments, and I have it on the screen, and I'm just going to read through that. But if you think about how Passover and communion, the Old Testament Passover, New Testament communion, right? Who is it for? Believers and older children. How do you receive the sacrament? You actively eat and drink. When do you do it? You do it many times. Some churches every week, some churches every month. 
Why do we do it? To remember and celebrate God's promises, right? Now, circumcision, Old Testament sacrament, baptism, New, sac New Testament sacrament. Who is it for? The children of covenant parents. How? Passively received, not active. When does it happen? Only once in your life. And why? It's to enter covenant community. It's the beginning of your covenant community relationships. So, I know that for some of you, the idea of baptizing children is new to you. I know some of you grew up in churches where you don't baptize children, and that's okay. You don't have to agree with this to be a member of One Voice Fellowship, okay? You can be a member of One Voice Fellowship and have a different understanding of baptism. Baptism is something that sincere Christians understand differently. See, you can faithfully study Scripture. You can faithfully study the Bible and, dis and understand that God is saying, I want you to baptize the children of believers. But you can also study the Bible faithfully and conclude that God wants baptism to come later when that child is older and makes a public announcement of their faith. What I'm saying is that we're all trying to faithfully submit to Scripture when we practice baptism. So Presbyterians and Baptists feel the same way about that. We're submitting to Scripture. And so because we're all trying to obey God the best we understand, we treat our brothers and sisters with charity and grace and love on this issue. And that's why we welcome into membership people at One Voice who don't feel led to have their children baptized. That's okay. It's okay if you don't feel that way. The only qualification for membership in this church is that you profess faith in Christ alone. Okay, you don't have to endorse or accept infant baptism or everything about our theology. But the reason I'm talking about this is I think it is helpful to share with you some of the very good biblical reasons we have for baptizing the children of believers. Remember that Abraham was instructed to circumcise every male in his household. Circumcision was performed on Abraham, who was 99 years old. It was performed on Ishmael when he was 13 years old. And it was performed on newborn baby Isaac, who was circumcised. And so the decision to circumcise did not depend on the age of the recipient. That's what I want you to see. It depended on the identity of the recipient. See, circumcision and baptism both identify people as a member of of God's covenant community. That's the purpose. It says you belong to covenant community. And so God's covenant promise was sealed on Abraham's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And so the boys, they had a sign, a physical sign on their body that said they were different than Moabite children or Hittite or Babylonian children. See, Abraham's descendants grew up in covenant homes. They knew and worshipped the one true God. Now, they didn't all walk with God as adults. That's a different question. And same with baptism. Some children who are baptized don't walk with God. Some children who are circumcised as babies don't walk with God. Many baptized people walk away from God. I'm sure you've seen it happen. God gives his covenant promises to the children of his people in many parts of the Bible. Um, Genesis 9-9 is another place where we see it. God promised to Noah. Um, he said, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. See that? And those same covenant promises apply to us today. Paul said in Galatians 3-29, he says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Do you know that? You're the great, 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 great grandsons and daughters of Abraham. You are spiritual heirs according to the promise. So Abraham's offspring received the covenant mark of circumcision in the past. Today, Abraham's spiritual offspring received the covenant mark of baptism. Same covenant, different sign. One more thing about this we'll say. 
that there's four ways the same spiritual significance is behind both circumcision and baptism. Both of the sacraments um, look back to the covenant promises that God made to Abraham. Both sacraments point to our guilt and that we need cleansing. Both of the sacraments acknowledge that the blood of Christ is the only cure for sin. And both of the sacraments call the recipient to walk in obedience and faith for all the days of their lives. So that's how they're connected. Um, so baptism is the New Testament sacrament. It serves the same purpose as the Old Testament circumcision. Um, now the sacrament of communion is another seal and sign of our covenant relationship with God. So I'm going to shift now to the other sacrament and talk about communion. Um, in the Old Testament, you had a covenant meal called Passover. And Passover celebrated the night in Egypt when God's people were protected from death by the blood of a lamb. Now in the New Testament, we have a covenant meal also, and it's called communion, sometimes called the Lord's Supper. And communion celebrates how God's people were protected from death by the blood of a lamb also. But this time it was the lamb of God by the blood of Jesus. So listen to how Jesus replaces Passover with the new covenant meal in Luke 22. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you, I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And then he said, take this, share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And then Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in pieces, just as we're going to do tonight. And he gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant. So it's the same covenant, but it's a new sign of the covenant. All right. The new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So Passover celebrated the work of God in the past when he saved his people from slavery. Communion also celebrates the work of God in the past, when Jesus saved us from slavery, slavery to sin. So when we come to the communion table to eat and drink, my friends, what we're doing is celebrating what Jesus did for us on the cross. At the table tonight, Jesus feeds us spiritually. He gives us strength to follow him and obey him. The sacraments... What I want you to remember is the sacraments are about the work of God in our lives. Focus on Jesus when you participate in the communion. Don't focus on the bread. Don't focus on the cup. Eating a bigger piece of bread won't deliver more Jesus to you, okay? If we had bigger cups of juice, it would not make you more spiritual to drink more of the juice. See, God doesn't put grace in the elements of bread and juice, and then you eat the grace, okay? We don't believe that power comes to us through sacred objects, okay? When we baptize, we don't use holy water to baptize people, and we're not serving holy bread and holy wine. I want you to know there's, there's no magic here. There's no magical power. There is power, but it's spiritual power. The water of baptism points you to Jesus. He's the Holy One. He can cleanse your soul, not the water. And the bread and the wine of communion, they point you to Jesus. They point you to him. He is our sacrificial lamb. He's the one who died to make you part of a covenant community in a way that's permanent and lasting. And so it's the Holy Spirit who pours out spiritual blessings you get strength from the Holy Spirit, not the bread, not the cup. The power you need in your life is not in the bread and the juice. 
It is God who has the power that you need. So look to him. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. And in John 6, 48, he says, yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they all died. But anyone who eats the bread from heaven will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I offer so the world may live is my flesh. So Jesus used all these different pictures. If you wonder why we have sacraments, it's because we don't understand things very well. And God wants to help us. So Jesus used different pictures to help us understand who he is and who he is for you, right? Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, I'm the gate. Jesus said, I'm the vine and the shepherd. I'm the way and the light of the world. And these pictures help us understand the mission of Christ on earth. So we don't put our hope in a door, right? We don't put our hope in the bread or the cup. We put our hope in Christ alone. I'm almost done, but listen to this good quote from a Scottish preacher named Robert Bruce. He said, in the preaching of the word, we're led to Christ by the ear. And in the sacraments, we're led to Christ by the eye. See, the purpose of every part of worship, everything we've done tonight, all of that is to lead you to Christ. If you think you can't find your way to God, friends, Jesus says he is the way. If it seems like God is behind some kind of barrier or wall, then Jesus is your door. If you're feeling the weight of your sin and your failures tonight, Jesus is the water who washes you and he is the blood who purifies you. And when Satan reminds you of your sin and he tries to burden you with guilt, remember your baptism. Remember what it means that you've been washed by the blood of Jesus. And when you're feeling lost, remember that Jesus is your shepherd and he's ready to guide you. If you feel faint, you feel weary, he is the vine that nourishes you. And when you're feeling weak, he is the bread that sustains you. And also, when you're full of joy, because you remember that you're God's child, then Christ invites you to share in the cup of celebration and one day in the wedding feast at heaven. So, let's pray together, and then we're going to come and celebrate communion together after we sing. Jesus, we are the sheep of your pasture. Thank you for being a good shepherd who knows us, protects us, and feeds us. And we are like stupid sheep. We do not learn well, and we forget what we learn. And so we need these different images and metaphors and pictures to help our feeble human minds understand your love and mercy. Father, we are stubborn. We want to go our own way. And so Holy Spirit, remind us how much we need Jesus. Remind us that we are children who depend on you for every good thing. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world.